Coming up on Theater Talk. Yes, yeah, that's no, the thing we about Stephen is that he'll wait till the last minute, and for two reasons. First of all, he, he does procrastinate a bit, but, yep. but secondly, he loves to sit in rehearsal and see what's happening. Mm -hmm. He wants to see the scene before. He wants to see the actors doing the part. He wants mm -hmm. to know what's going on with the lights, all of this. And then he can write from character in the brilliant way that he does. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Michael, there is a fantastic new revival of Follies yeah, on the, Broadway, and we're going to talk about it tonight. And, and for the first time, I think, in the history of Follies, Susan, this one is actually making a lot of money, <laughs> over a million dollars a week. It's astounding. So I think the time has come, finally, for this great show. We are joined tonight by Ted Chapin of the Rodgers and Hammerstein organization, who wrote the, the, the Bible on the history of Follies, Everything Was Possible, The Birth of the Musical Follies. And Ted, you were a, a gopher in the original production. I was indeed. I go forward everything. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And we have a special treat because we have two of the original <laughs> cast members from the 1971 production of Follies. We are joined by Kurt Peterson, who was young Ben in the original production. He was also in West Side Story and Dear World with Angela Lansbury. And our friend Harvey Evans, who was the original buddy in Follies. And Harvey, you have such a list of credits. <laughs> The show will be over if I read them all, but West Side Story, we'll read them all. Gypsy, <laughs> and Hello, Dolly. Gentlemen, thank you very, very much for joining us. Our um, pleasure. Yeah, all right, so guys, I wanted to ask you, I've always been curious about this. The first time you performed what is now considered a groundbreaking show in front of an audience that paid for their tickets in Boston, I believe, what was the reaction from this crowd to this show that they had never seen anything like this before. The dress rehearsal was chaos. I mean, <laughs> uh, we were over costumed and the, the ghosts were in white makeup and everybody was a mess at, at that uh, dress rehearsal. That's what I remember. And, and, and it was sort of depressing. And your memories of that for those well, early I, performances? You know, it's a little, uh, the audience reaction is a little blurred, but I think at that point, because we were the younger ghosts, they had us painted like younger ghosts, meaning white faced. And I think we had wigs on that were giving us major headaches at the same time. Wild. <laughs> Did you have a sense, though, that as you were trying to show out in Boston that it was getting better or that people were starting to get it? Or did you feel an audience resisting it and just not liking it? I think we, we had so much uh, to worry about just performing it that I don't think we thought what the audience was, was getting. Mm. We knew, I mean, I had seen company opening night and it just dazzled me and I thought I, anything that Prince and Sondheim are going to do I want to be part of. So I don't think I judged the show as much as just getting our costumes right and everything uh, because I knew it was going to be terrific. Yeah. And and when when we finally put the new prologue in, the which, which we'll talk about I'm sure, the last performance in uh, Boston, our whole morale changed. We became a hit suddenly. The prologue worked like uh, magic, just magic. What was there? What was there before? The, the, the there were two versions of the prologue, and they were all right. similar in style. But I think the genius of Michael Bennett was to see something that worked and worked very well, and just decide, no, no, I can make this better. Mm -hmm. Yes. And he all through Boston, there was a lot of other things to do. Putting in, I'm still here, changing, uh, if, uh, changing uh, Alexis's song. There's a lot of st and little things, but Michael was working on the prologue all the way through Boston right. and as Harvey said the last performance yeah. it went in yeah. and it just it, it just clicked everybody felt that it really clicked it yeah. just it set up what the show was all about in a way that the others hadn't quite and for people who haven't seen Follies that prologue is the, the very opening it's right. the, uh, the the spotlight on the showgirl the opening chord in the beginning sets the scene Duh, and then right. you and then you know you, you do now though there's Follies and it, it's, yeah. it's based on a song that was cut all things bright and beautiful. I mean, it's the other thing about Michael Bennett and Steve Sondheim as a collaborative team. You know, Michael wanted to hear everything that had been cut because the show, as you know, had been written as the girls upstairs and it's taken all kinds of different forms through the years. So Michael was hungry to hear everything Steve had, had written and he took this song, which I think was a Sally song that had been cut and it's that weird kind of wonderful ethereal sound. And, and basically yeah. it was setting up both the ghost filled theater in which the show takes place but also the beginning of the party. You talk a lot about Michael Bennett, and, and you know, only a few years later, Michael is going to emerge as the most powerful director on Broadway with a chorus line. Could you see in his relationship 
with Hal Prince or where he was in his career at this point that he was ready to go out on his own and command a show himself? Do you remember anything about that? Oh, yes, yeah. yes, right away. Where was Hal in all this, Ted? What, what? Well, what I think is, is, <clears throat> is interesting you know, to, to note, I mean, I... Because this tells us how shows were put together. Exactly, and, and as, as Harvey said, um, the, the Michael Bennett and, and Hal Prince together, mm -hmm. a, a company was something that was so unified. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very hard to tell where the musical staging left the choreography that left the staging that the director would have done. It was right. all of a unit and of a piece. And when Follies came along, I think Michael was savvy enough and ambitious enough to know that the way Follies was going to be set in this wonderful abstraction of a theater, that Hal was going to need a lot of that movement around. Right. So he actually convinced Hal to be co-director. Uh, and I don't know that that was comfortable for either one of them, but it certainly resulted in a pro certainly production that really felt co-directed mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in the same time it was dramatically interesting and the movement just never stopped. Whose right, idea was that set that was in the first version, this very conceptual, stretched out abstraction, as you say? Well, th there's a wonderful um, first drawing of Boris Aronson's for the set, mm -hmm. which I assume comes, came after conversations with Steve and Hal and Jim Goldman. And what's fascinating is that even though there are things in it that are sort of a, a very simple watercolor notions, the final set was a sort of realization of the abstract notion. I mean, one thing that I have to say from my standpoint, and I'll, I'll go here, there's no production of Follies that I've seen since the original that understood the value of, doing, of setting it in something that is abstract. Mm. Because because you never were actually in a theater, you didn't see a back wall, you didn't see it. You saw these pieces of set that came and went magically. Mm. So that you, you know there were levels and things. Mm. I mean, somebody asked me the other day about the Right Girl Buddy's song. Right, right. And Gene Nelson was uh, up on a level, mm -hmm. and he start he watched too many mornings. Then he started dancing up on a level, and then part of the choreography was to start dancing up there and then dancing down a spiral staircase and staying up on a level and then finally getting to the center of the stage. Now, tell us some of the backstage tales, Guy, because uh, I know this was not an easy show. Can you give us uh, who, who was a real pain in the ass to work with of all these grand old ladies? Which one did you love? Which one did you avoid? Well, there's a good story that uh, uh, Ethel Chate was our favorite. We she loved. Just, well, she <laughs> and she played. Fantastic. Uh, uh, she was Broadway baby. Yeah, yeah. right, right. And Dorothy Beef. Collins we loved. Yeah. Oh, Dorothy yeah. Collins yeah. was, uh, yeah. it was uh, <laughs> like uh, uh, Alexis and Dorothy were both very nice, but Alexis's door was closed. Dorothy's door was open <laughs> all the time. So she was the, our mom. Yeah. You know, if you had a problem, you went to Dorothy. You didn't go to Alexis. <laughs> but Fifi was a little bit of a pain in the butt, uh, <laughs> especially because she couldn't remember her lyrics out of town. She had major problems with lyrics. Well, and, Fifi I mean, they talked about Yvonne and Jean, but it was Fifi that. <laughs> so, was, so wait, it was Ah Perry that Fifi? Yes, yeah, Ah Perry. And she, oh. But one time she came into the room and there was no chair for her. And uh, she stood there like wanting someone to give her, her th their chair. And, and Ethel Chate went, squattez-vous, Fifi. <laughs> 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 uh, you're in your book. Yeah, no, it's in the book. And, right. your, and, yeah. and Kurt, your memories of some, I mean, these, these great old ladies who must have had huge egos back there. Well, you know, the, I think one of the, the, the genius parts of casting the original and the thing that they couldn't do now is the fact that 1971 did reflect, and these people lived in the vaudeville in those times. You know, right. Ethel Chate was in Whoopi with Eddie Cantor. That's right. And the movie stars, you know, that were, Yvonne was the fading movie star from that era. Bon DiCarlo. And the, the yeah. song references that era as well. So there's a lot, a lot of genius in, in that. Uh, so uh, my favorite Ethel story is how she sort of embellished Broadway Baby. You know, there's, she, she was staged in a very, very uh, sort of tight presentation of it, but pretty soon she started to, to move a little bit more. And, and then at one point, you know, she says, at my tiny flat, there's my cat, and she kicks the cat off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta laugh, it stays in. And and Dorothy, uh, she she was our mother, but she was just the Oh, she was Mother Earth and she was just just so special as a cheerleader for the whole company. And Alexis and she was a little more frightened because I don't think she had as much stage time as Dorothy and as much singing time as Dorothy. Uh -huh. So she was a little frightened and I understand that. So she was, you know, sad and she was she wanted to be good. It was she was big. She had the red dress on. I wanna talk about Steve. So these songs are um, uh, classics now. Do you have memories of hearing the first time Steve Sondheim plays Broadway Baby for you or I'm Still Here? Oh. I remember the first time <laughs> we heard uh, uh, Yvonne saying I'm Still Here. Uh, I don't think we ever heard Steve sing it first, but that was the, 
absolutely mind blowing. We really? were sitting in the audience at the uh, the theater in Boston, and uh, Yvonne kept postponing singing it for the company. Hal would say, "You got to you got to sing it sooner or later. <laughs> you got to, you know." <laughs> so she said, "All right, I'll try or something." And uh, we, we were all just blown away. Ah. I mean, what can you say? I, still hearing, I'm still here is breathtaking. But that first time. Steve did a playthrough for all the songs that were written, mm -hmm. I think the first day of rehearsal, you know, and, and Ted, because we go back and forth a lot of things. We, up this <laughs> time we got little archives. Um, and, and our song wasn't there yet. They no, no, why well, have a script we, that said... We came in, we're looking for our lines in our song, and, well, and your song there. Wasn't, sorry, uh, <laughs> no, we, we, he hadn't no. written it yet when we started rehearsals. Oh, I see. And, and this, this is, is, this is, is, are you doing your song here? Yes, yes we, we are. are. When yes, was the camera... Are. Oh, that's Loveland, right? <laughs> you're, you're, yeah. Yeah. And, and you're so gonna, you can love tomorrow, and, and yeah. love will see us through. Yeah, with Michael's choreography. So with both, both songs that were not written, and they were written when you were going to rehearsals. Yes, yeah. that's, that's no, the thing we, about we Stephen is that he'll wait till the last minute, and for two reasons. First of all, he, he does procrastinate a bit, but yeah. but secondly, he loves to sit in rehearsal and see what's happening. Mm -hmm. He wants to see the scene before. He wants to see the actors doing the part. He wants mm -hmm. to know what's going on with the lights, all of this. And then he can write from character in the brilliant way that he does, mm -hmm. and so so a lot of the numbers are late to the late to the party. And you said, did we realize that all the numbers were classics? I don't think when Stephen sings and does a playthrough, <laughs> <laughs> you can tell. You can tell I, you, uh, right away. <laughs> I don't know. If you no, know no, no, no. I can't tell because Steve, Steve's not the greatest singer yes. or piano player yes. in the world. For yes. you. No. But, but I think well, one of the things that was clear from, from the beginning, because he wrote what he refers to as pastiche songs and mm -hmm. follies, mm -hmm. because there's sort of the Kurt Weill song, there's the, there's the Irving Berlin, Beautiful Girls, right, sort of right. like a, a Pretty Goes Like a Melly. Um, so they were fun, and you could say, oh, that's kind of fun, and yeah, a stomping yeah. song, yeah. the Broadway Baby was kind of a stomping song, and yeah, then the yeah. French number was, oh, that's kind of like a... So that those numbers were all kind of accessible in a way that, that, that he wasn't known for in, in those days, right. which in some ways made the other songs, the Ben songs, the Road You Didn't Take, and songs like that, Losing my which, mind, which are so much yeah. more his voice, yeah. you know, really fascinating. And remember, he wasn't the god that he is today. Right, right, right. I say that because he said that himself in his last show. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, and so the, the, there were fans. He had fans, but they just learned company the year before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in, even if a few of us knew about Anyone Can Whistle, but for the most part, and uh, funny thing happened with the forum, but he was never really noticed properly for the North score. Side score. Now, when you came to New York, though, the show, I mean, the show lost something like $800,000. It was the most expensive flop of all time. Did you have a sense that this just wasn't catching on when you were in New York? Uh, yes, I guess we did because of the reviews opening night. I remember Hal reading uh, uh, Clive Barnes' review at the party being really upset mm. by the fact that it wasn't accepted. Um, What's wonderful for us now is 51, 41 years later, we're in a hit. I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're in, well, don't give up. Say, <laughs> but I have to say, too, about Steve, you, uh, and this is from doing Older Buddy lately, but you yeah. learn more from his lyrics than you do from the book writer. Yeah. You can find your character in his songs so easily. He's just that good of a writer. Yeah. They've, they've, now, the book has taken knocks over the years, and I know Bobby Goldman, James Goldman's widow, has fiddled around with it and all that. Did you think the book was good in the original production, or was it, was it a problem? Well, I have to, 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 to comment on the book from being 63 years old. When I was 22, you know, I was hired because I was half conscious. Yeah. You know, those young people <laughs> yeah. aren't, don't know the end. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, you know, I was just sort of watching and, and sort of a fly on the wall, and we'd walk, run on stage and say a couple lines, run off. We didn't know, or I didn't know, speaking for myself, the, the genius yeah. that, that was going on and, and, and that kind of thing. Jonathan Tunick made a wonderful comment to me at the, at the Roundabout Revival. He said, you know, when I first did this show, I thought, look at these sweet, wonderful young people, and look at those unfortunate middle-aged people and those old people. And then he did the revival. He thought, you know, look at those callous youth and these sweet. <laughs> <laughs> he intends at some point to say, look at these sweet, wonderful older people, what lives they've led. <laughs> All right, we got to wrap it up. Just one final thought. Do you remember the, do you remember the closing night performance? When oh yes, they were what we call the Follies Freaks, and they were people who, you know, not just five times, you know, <laughs> 10, 12, 15, 20. They loved the show so much. They knew it so well, and they were so supportive. And they were they were there. It was just the we couldn't hear where our entrance was yeah. supposed to be because yeah. of the applause. It was so exciting. Continuous applause so exciting. for everybody that came on stage. And we yeah. were going, "Where are we? Where are we?" <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a hit to me. Absolutely. <laughs> Forty-one years later, you guys are a hit. All right. Uh, I want to thank uh, Ted Chapin from uh, Roger and Hammerstein. 
<laughs> office uh, who wrote the indispensable everything was possible thank you michael of Bravo. musical <laughs> follies uh, and great great to have the original young ben with us kurt peterson kurt peterson and the original young buddy harvey evans thanks thank you thank all you. thank you thank you thank Now, Susan, you may think the hottest show in town is Hugh Jackman on Broadway, but I've got news for you. There is a show that is infinitely better that you cannot get a ticket to that is turning this town upside down. It's called Jackie Hoffman's A H Hanukkah Carol. Is that how I pronounce it? Hanukkah Carol. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas Carol, Hanukkah Carol. Carol at the New World Stages. It stars our good, good friend and one of the funniest women in New York, Aww. Jackie Hoffman, who's single-handedly keeping the Adams Family going after more Until than tomorrow, a year on right. Broadway. And what a sad year 2012 will be for you, Michael. What are you going to destroy next <laughs> without us as the target? It's, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> I did my best to bring that show down, but you beat me at my own game and you ran it a year and a half. We kept it up. We had the love of the people. <laughs> You never run out of morons. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I say that? And I'm so honored to follow Follies. They're still here. <laughs> right across the street. <laughs> now, For I, a day. Before we get to your wonderful um, Hanukkah Christmas Carol show, I do want to talk a little bit about the Addams Family. Because... Oh, God. <laughs> it was a trap. Was a, and, and I no, come know. on the show. We'll talk about your show. <laughs> I'm just curious. It's New Year's. I'm going to bring it. Drinking. I'm just curious. Now, what is it like to be in a Broadway show that was as despised by the critics and the, the theater community as The Addams Family was? I, mean, I thought you made up with those people. I didn't know, but, what, but I'm just curious. What is it like from your perspective when you guys are in it and you open this show and the critics just pile on and then the community piles on and denies you Tony Awards and all that stuff? <laughs> well, I'm no stranger to being denied a Tony Award. <laughs> But it was, um, it was a strange couple of weeks, like after, you know, because in previews we got a lovely response from the audiences, and then after those reviews and after you did your little Nazi number, uh, <laughs> the audiences were not sure, what do we, we want to laugh, but we don't, we can't, not allowed. So it was, a, it was strange for a while, and then, and then it settled down, and people forgot about it, mm. really. So I mean, I try to remind people periodically in my yeah, column. Thank you for that. <laughs> well, you have to thank Spider-Man for coming along. and Spider-Man yes, came, yes. Spider came along. And, and out-disastering us. <laughs> And uh, do you, I mean, I, I know uh, Nathan Lane pretty well, and he strikes me as having kind of a gallows sense of humor about everything. Do you guys just kind of... That's kinda... why we got along so well. <laughs> and you the just... only person who's darker than I am, Nathan, <laughs> God love him. That's right. And you just soldier on through, and it's a job, and you've got people to entertain, and the critics are over... Yeah, well, it wasn't like working in a morgue. I mean, we, <laughs> we had a good time. We made, we made each other laugh. We still do, and we make the audiences laugh. You know, I mean... Brantley's not in the house every night saying, I still hate it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's people who are like, I like, this is funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's your target audience, baby. Mm -hmm. All right, you're uh, Jackie Hoffman's a Hanukkah Herald at the New Close World. enough. Yes. <laughs> at the New World stages. Uh, you're you're playing a, many different parts in this. I am. Scrooge. It's a, it's, a, it's a departure for me. It's my first uh, foray away from the cabaret format, and it's a one-woman play, and I play all of the characters. Uh, I make a natural Scrooge for obvious reasons, <laughs> and I even play Patrick Stewart as my own narrator. <laughs> it's inspired by Patrick Stewart. This was inspired Stewart, by, by that's right, his character. famous Christmas Carol that he mm -hmm. won several awards for back, back in the day. How do you do uh, the, the, the ghost of things yet to come? In a hood? Well, it's a... Yes, that's visualized, and, and Patrick says, a, a faceless figure cloaked and draped. And then I express my relief that you're the ghost of Hanukkah's yet to be, right? You don't talk? Good. One less character voice. <laughs> so that's how we take care of that one. And, what and it gives me time to react. <laughs> 
what got you thinking about doing uh, doing this kind of a show? Did you really like that Patrick Stewart Christmas Carol years ago? Um, I, I just thought it was a great idea, and my director and frequent collaborator, Michael Shirelli, and I wanted to, let's do something different. And I just said, didn't Patrick Stewart do a one-man Christmas Carol? Why don't we, because we've always wanted to, you know, there's so many of the, my life. Then when I was 11, I knew I could sing and I knew I was gay. Who cares? So we've seen <laughs> enough of these autobiographical, boring pieces of dreck. And we, we've never really touched on my life and gotten that personal. And so we wanted to do what was the most entertaining and funny, spectacular and unusual way we could do it. And ghosts of Hanukkah past, present and future. So we tackle all this. Uh, it's kind of like a jazz singer meets Christmas carol. You know, the neurotic Jewish conflict. Jolie, become a cantor. I can. I love showbiz. Mwah! You know, we get that in. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the career and You've done three big Broadway musicals, accumulating 12 total minutes of stage time. And then you get <laughs> to the future, and in the future, uh, I'm, uh, uh, we're going to do a reality show starring you. It's an ugly Betty meets ugly you. Ugly Jew. <laughs> and then it just gets incredibly grotesque and incredibly funny. Uh, there's two chorus boys uh, for Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS who are going through my stuff. <laughs> and, and it will be worth a lot more now since she's you know. <laughs> <laughs> Have you always uh, ha had this ability to, 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 to make fun of yourself? I mean, you, you, make, you make yourself the, the butt of a lot of the jokes in these shows. Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> well, uh, an, an intensely organic self-loathing helps a lot. So it just comes <laughs> naturally. naturally. Yeah, doing a what comes naturally. You are a dark you are a dark person. I mean, I've seen you. Yeah, you'd around think the I've had a lot more hardship than I have, but <laughs> somehow I, I don't know whether it's an innate Jewish suffering. I don't know what it is. Mm. I don't know if it's missing Hugh Jackman by a hair. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we should say for people who uh, 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 didn't see the, the backstage show here, Jackie came in uh, to the studio today and she just missed our other guest, Hugh Jackman. <laughs> <laughs> And you can't get in to see his show at all, right? Uh, well, I will have plenty of time come January 1st. <laughs> Has Hugh been by to see the Adams Family? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit! <laughs> I don't believe so, although bevies of celebrities have come to our show. <laughs> now, I noticed in, you had a very funny uh, one-woman show not too long ago. Called, I think it was called Jackie Five O. Yes, it was. And you had some... Did you really, see that one? Yes, I loved that one. It was great. Uh, you had some hilarious lines about the Adams Family, and there was one line, the only show that even gay men, what was that? I'm in the only Broadway musical that doesn't appeal to gay people. <laughs> <laughs> when you deliver these ears, does the, the producers and the investors of the Adams Family, do they say, uh, Jackie, you're in the show, we're paying your salary, and well, I, fun of it publicly? I'm more mocked people like yourself who were taking those barbs at us. Oh, good. And um, I, they, I don't think they think I have enough monetary influence on their product. I mean, my audience is drastically different than the Adams Family audience, <laughs> as you can tell by the lack of response from the Adams Family audience to anything that I say. <laughs> Uh, Jackie Five O is going to L.A. when you're done with the Yes, Adams Family. thank you, Susan. It is going to L.A. for two weekends at the Gay Lesbian Center in L.A., which has like 40 names. Yes, yes. The Lily Tomlin, Harold Gould, Lillian <laughs> Gish, Mario Cantone <laughs> Theater in, uh, in Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> so you're going... Weekend of January 13th and then the following weekend. So, uh, and is this kind of, are you testing the waters out in Hollywood? I mean, a possible Jackie Hoffman pilot? Any interest from the studios? In well, I... I don't think I'll ever be allowed on camera, but um, it, at least let me take, because you know, theater in L.A., boy, that's magic. <laughs> <laughs> They're fools not to build a show around you. They are fools oh. not to build a show. I mean, you've built a show around yourself. Thank they, you. I think take the if it were 1965, I'd be working like crazy. Well, now we would, oh, we I was just going to say, but you would, be, you would be a laugh-in person. You'd be on a, something like a Carol Burnett show. I mean, Variety would be right. what you would have done so well. The Imogene Coca, Ruth Buzzy. Yeah. And now they all get grotesque facelifts and everybody looks alike and there's no faces anymore. Yes, they, right. That's right. They have no, that's what <laughs> How my, frightening. All right, let's toast the new year, darling. Well, let's toast Jackie's show. Let's toast Jackie's show.
Jackie Hoffman's a Hanukkah Carol. Am I? Yes, I, I'm, I'll take I'm, it. I'm Presbyterian, so I want to get my, my Hanukkah Carol. January second, correct? <laughs> January second at, at the new at New World Stages. World Stages. It's the same room as the Bubble Show, so the seats are oh. a little sticky. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I also want to salute you for um, soldiering on in the Adams family for a year and a half. Thank to you. the Adams family. Here's to an Adams Free 2012. <laughs> <laughs> Your dream has come true. <laughs> Jackie Huffman, it's always a pleasure. We'll see your show. It's going to be great. L'chaim. See you in Thank L.A. You. <laughs> Wait, this isn't champagne. This is ginger ale. Yes, I told you. There's a roofie in here. <laughs> what kind of show are you running? <laughs> we invite a guest and we, we don't give her shout out. I hope the cameras are running. I hope the cameras are running. I close off wherever I am. <laughs> Where's Hugh? <laughs> yeah. Good night, everybody. <laughs> we, we bring a guest in and you give her ginger ale and not real champagne? What is this? When Hugh was here, we had real champagne for him. No, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jackie Hoffman. You can sign up for viewer updates at theatertalk.org. Or you can Twitter us. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>